Leviathan is a pretty ambitious and kind of sprawling project. The world was ending. We were being obliterated. Through a complex time delay mechanism. When I was asked by Eflux Journal to write a piece on democracy, and I think and normally I'm quite good at getting things in by a deadline, and two years after being asked to write the piece, I sort of called up um, Brian uh, at Eflux and just said, I can't do it. He said, What's the problem? And I said, Well, I've got thousands and thousands of words of notes, but it sounds you know, it sounds like the ravings of somebody with severe multiple personality disorder. And he wasn't as put off by that as I thought. And we sort of brainstormed it a bit. And he said, well, have you thought about writing fiction? And I said, well, you don't publish fiction. He said, well, we could start. And I said, well, I could start. And the foundation of it was sort of somehow taking a lot of my thoughts on democracy. And then, you know, to clarify my interest in the sea, I was in my studio and thinking a lot about uh, newspaper headlines of, of migrants and refugees undertaking very perilous sea journeys. And I guess I started to kind of wonder what was happening beneath the surface of the sea, simultaneous to their, their passages on the surface. And I started going out and meeting with oceanographers, um, marine biologists, um, and migrant rights activists, political scientists and was just sort of in that kind of you know you know almost embarrassingly amateurish way just going I have these I have just thought there might be a connection between these things and you might laugh me out of the room but you know what do you think and um, literally the first room of of oceanographers and marine biologists I walked into they were like oh my god yes and they were desperate to tell me a series of facts in my head, it was a kind of metaphor. It wasn't, it didn't have physical reality. And this one oceanographer said, actually, there is a vent on the sea floor directly under the Lamp Lampedusa crossing. And it's, um, it's a key kind of flashpoint that they monitor uh, in terms of, um, of warming seawaters. It's in the Mediterranean, obviously, and you've got uh, the water heating up on the eastern side and uh, and moving across this vent onto the western side. And what that does, because it sort of swells as it moves up and over, it creates the riptides and eddies that make that crossing so dangerous. So there was like this really kind of simple plumb line kind of physical connection between, you know, migrants losing their lives uh, at sea and what was happening sort of geologically and in terms of climate. Les oiseaux volaient juste vers le sud. Mais nous avons créé des règles qui permettaient à certains gens d'aller dans un sens et laisser le reste aller uniquement dans un autre. The way I've thought through it is that in a way the the sculptures relate to the past, the paintings relate to the present and the films relate to the immediate future and that's been my way of sort of compartmentalizing it. One of the highlights for me of the project so far is that researchers in the different fields have started speaking to each other with no need of me or my involvement. And that's really, you know, that's really job done from my point of view. We are in a, in a moment of very similar inequity to when Swift wrote. You know, that sort of division between, uh, you know, wealth and poverty is, is back to the same kind of level of inequity. And then also the sort of the, the marine kind of uh, metaphor where you know, the sea is this sort of, is this thing that we can't contain. Uh, the paintings uh, are through a kind of relationship, a collaboration with the Labanoff, uh, which is the laboratory of anthropological forensics at the University of Milan. And I was really fascinated by their work for a while. And uh, through Alfredo Cramarotti, who curated the project in Venice, uh, he managed to get us out to Milan to meet Cristina Cataneo, who runs the Labanoff. And it's this typically underfunded department um, that go out and do this amazing work. You know, they, they basically go out with UN rescue teams when si uh, ships sink or capsize, attempting the Lampedusa crossing. And they recover personal artifacts, even human remains from the sea floor. 
And what they do is they catalog uh, all those artifacts. And basically, there's two functions to the archive uh, that, they're, that they have. The first is to help relatives track missing family members and kind of close the, the sort of cycle of trauma. Because when people at least know what's become of their family, it's, it gives them some sort of closure so they can move on. And then the second function is to lobby individual governments and the European Parliament when they're not meeting their obligations vis-a-vis -vis refugees, which has been a lot in the news when people have sort of just ignored ship sinking, etc. You know, it's that sort of like, you know, you know, see no evil, hear no evil uh, scenario, which is sort of, you know, it's, it's almost fatal to our, our ethical kind of survival. What I wanted to do was to kind of somehow um, reference that archive you know so i've worked on these individual textiles and each one represents a life lost because these are the each t each textile each painting on textile has one or more objects that were recovered from an individual the films um represent almost this sort of imagined future in my head 20 to 50 years hence you know based on actually scientific <laughs> you know uh, uh, conversations that i've had people sharing you know estimates of where the world might be. After you've had about 10 conversations with people concerned with climate change at, at any serious level, you're like, oh God, you know, it's quite, it's quite depressing because there's an elephant in the room. And you know, I remember sort of finally saying to someone, what is the answer that you're not saying? And it's kind of like, well, you know, we need to reduce the human population by half last week and, and reduce it in such a way that it doesn't uh, pollute further. You know, so we'd almost have to be vaporized by some very sophisticated technology that we don't possess. Uh, because there's that way in which we are the kind of cancer in the world. You know, we can't st seem to stop ourselves, uh, both in terms of our rabid consumption, in terms of our lack of empathy and compassion. Quite early in the process, when I started writing, I went back to speak to a leading oceanographer and just said, I'm really worried about where this is going. And, you know, I don't want to be part of the problem. He just said, you know, well, 20 years of very upbeat environmentalism hasn't actually changed anything. If anything, it's made it worse. So, you know, I think you need to just say what you need to say. I don't want to just sound pessimistic. You know, there's just so many people who obviously, despite the bleakness of the situation, have not given up hope. You know, just the fact that they're working night and day on these subjects, trying to kind of find restitution from governments, trying to, uh, you know, raise awareness, monitor data, look at sort of new methods. You know, um, you know, one good friend of mine who's become a friend through the process, uh, Francesco Falcieri, who's a scientist, his speciality is microplastics, you know, which we're reading about more and more, but he's been on the subject for yonks. You know, it's also about legislative changes. I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of lovely and very important work being done with the symptoms, but I think it, you know, what for me becomes really important is, and what needs to be dealt with in a much more accelerated fashion is the structures behind it, which are ultimately legislative. Siamo le carogne che nutriranno i nostri dei. Lasciamoli venire a divorarci. Diventiamo un tutt'uno con i vecchi dei.